Good afternoon, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to everyone. And uh, thank you for taking out time from your busy schedules today and joining in for this webinar. My name is Anubhuti and I am from team IBM. Well, uh, today the Singapore Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and IBM have collaborated together to create a knowledge sharing platform where we will be sharing some great insights on how to leverage AI, blockchain and other technologies to proactively build supply chain resilience. And we will also learn that how our other customers are handling disruptions and resolving issues faster while building trust and strengthening their supply chain. So um, uh, basically uh, today, the need for supply chain visibility and resilience is far more in the context of COVID-19 pandemic. And I think you all will agree with me. So without any further delay, I would like to pass the baton uh, in the safe hands of Mr. Manish Tapati who is also the vice chairman of SIKI, and he is also the director and board member of DigiLife Technologies Limited, Singapore. Manish, over to you, please. And thank you, Anubhuti. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And we warmly welcome from the chamber side, uh, from SICCI's side to the IBM team. Uh, we also very warmly welcome our chairman, Dr. T. Chandru. Dr. Chandru, thank you for taking out your very busy schedule and being with us on this technology webinar. I'll just take about two, three minutes to set the stage. This is a very niche initiative done, uh, taken up by Singapore Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry to help in the overall energy which dovetails the digitization of Singapore. Uh, we've heard many webinars on AI, uh, networking, uh, ERP, software, but I think uh, Chamber for the first time is doing uh, a seminar or a webinar with uh, industry leaders, uh, one of the industry leader like IBM on blockchain and AI put together. And we are very privileged to have some very eminent speakers from uh, IBM Asia Pacific, and I'll let Dr. Chandru give a quick name introduction for them. Uh, why this seminar? The supply chain in the pandemic is one of the biggest discussion factor. Uh, many countries are getting food security, wellness, medicine security, other essential supply security. People are making a plan. How does the supply chain work in the case of a pandemic? And today we are going to talk about the, the importance of blockchain, technology surrounding blockchain, artificial intelligence if needed, and the other networking solutions which, which come behind as an infrastructure solution behind blockchain to see how supply chain, chain can become more resilient for Singapore and, and any other country where Singapore works with or has a supply chain network. So with that introduction, I'm... Uh, very pleased that we have a, a, a very niche audience with us who understand this space and there are others who wish to understand more about this space. And I would now request our chairman, Dr. T. Chandru, who by himself is, is an industry leader. He's a social leader in Singapore. He has guided the chamber for more than 20 years, last four years as our chairman. And he himself is steeped into technology. He says, Manish, I don't need to know the nitty gritties, but I need to know where technology is going so we can guide the businesses and our members in the chamber. So in that spirit, Dr. Chandru, we had this webinar done with IBM. And may I now request you to come and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manish Bhai, for your kind words. Uh, let me formally welcome all of you particularly members of the SICCI board, friends from IBM, and of course, attendees of the Sabina. I'd like to especially welcome the speakers, Mr. Brandon Lelo. I believe he's the Asia Pacific business unit leader for IBM Sterling supply chain and B2B solutions. Let me also welcome Mr. Levin Naidu, business executive, IBM Sterling, Mr. Lester, Mr. Gopi, and Gaidra, who are senior management from the InfoTrust Singapore and his team. And of course, our charming uh, Anupati Jog, the country sales leader for IBM Thank Singapore. You. I initiated 
the SICCI's Digitalization Masterclass as part of its Thought Leadership Series. In this edition, we are focusing on supply chain resilience through digital transformation. The Minister of Trade and Industry, Gan Kim Yong, announced during Vice President, the US Vice President, of course, Kamala Harris' visit to Singapore on August 24, 2021, that Singapore can assist the United States in strengthening its supply chains and deepening ties within the region. Hence, SICCI views this opportunity as an important one and as a relevant addition to the knowledge base that we are developing on digitalization for our members and affiliates. We'll certainly hear from IBM experts on how to achieve complete visibility and resilience across the supply chain and hope there will be significant takeaways for you. I'm sure you have heard of SICCI, the Singapore Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which was established in 1924. And the Chamber's mission is to help develop and promote enterprise and entrepreneurship in Singapore. This is an ongoing endeavor, and we strive to build the entrepreneurial spirit in Singapore through a wide range of activities and initiatives every year. Certainly, this year is no exception. In keeping with our objectives of promoting entrepreneurship and internationalization, SICCI constantly is working to spur the entrepreneurial spirit, not only in Singapore, but also around the world. We have a dedicated SME service that helps Singapore companies to expand and take advantage of grants to enhance their productivity and also digitalize and internationalize. As a result of the establishment of the International Business Division, IBD in short, SICCI now has a dedicated service that helps its members run businesses overseas. For SMEs that are interested in internationalizing, IBD provides market intelligence, explains tax and legal advice, and recommends appropriate government schemes. Business advisors and market experts assist the IBD team in guiding SMEs in their internationalization journey. Today, the need for supply chain visibility and resilience is far more urgent in view of COVID-19 pandemic. Thus, through this webinar, members will be able to understand how to get real-time information and actionable, actionable recommendations that will reduce the disruption time from days to hours. Leverage on the use of AI with other technologies to proactively build supply chain resilience. Minimize the complexity of supplier onboarding and collaboration. Learn how other customers are handling disruptions and resolving issues faster while building trust and strengthening their supply chains. And of course, to create an environment for frictionless trade with the right partners by having the right information at the right time. It couldn't have come at a better time for us to have this conversation on Zoom with you. At a later date, IBM will be conducting a workshop with companies to discuss current business issues related to supply chains and the solutions as a follow-up of today's session. Without much ado, I would like now to hand the session over to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chandru, our chairman from the chamber. You have articulated it wonderfully. So the stage is set. And uh, without further ado, may I request Brent. Hi, Brent. 
Uh, Brent is the Asia Pacific leader for, as Dr. Chandru mentioned, for IBM Sterling Supply Chain and B2B Solutions. And we are privileged to have you with us, Brent. All yours. Thank you so much, Manish. And uh, what, what such eloquent words from the chairman around um, uh, on supply chain and the importance of supply chain and the, and the importance of ensuring resilient supply chain. So, um, so thank you so much. Really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to set some very quick context before I hand it across to my esteemed colleague, Levine, uh, to take us through the, the, the full gamut of what IBM uh, is, you know, out there in the marketplace, helping customers doing with supply chains. But, but I'd, I'd like, you know, to, to think, you know, for a moment, what role you play in owning, if you have your own supply chain, or if your trading partners um, within multiple supply chains. And if you reflect over the last 18 months or so, you know, what issues there have been in those supply chains, um, how often you've asked yourselves a question in terms of how I might be able to, you know, improve that, make that more efficient, uh, et cetera. And, and now is the right time. We are talking to clients right across, uh, all the way from India to China, all across ASEAN, all the way down here in Australia and New Zealand about, you know, how IBM can help organisations understand um, the, the impacts. And Manish, uh, we talked about the workshops that IBM can run, um, how we can help you identify the, the business impacts of those uh, disruptions on your supply chains, and also how we can plan to deliver immediate value to your organisations by addressing this particular aspect or that particular part of the supply chain or improving that efficiency and that particular component over there. So Levine is going to take us through the full story here. Um, but, but I guess one thing, you know, to, to go into this is that, you know, there's some provocative statements here, right? But if you were able to reduce the time needed, right, for critical supply chain disruption, right, to manage that, right, um, and if you could change that from up to three weeks, 21 days, down to a number of hours, would that be of business benefit and advantage to you? And I'm sure the answer is yes. If you were able to decrease your inventory levels, right, and prevent out of stock, um, et cetera, by up to 18%, would that be of value? And I think that you would say yes. And if you could actually track and trace items throughout your supply chains, from, the, from your own supply chain to trading partner supply chains, and reduce the amount of time that it takes to trace items uh, from store back to producer, manufacturer, from seven days potentially down to a number of seconds, then I think that you would say that that is a significant business benefit and gain as well. So some provocative statements there, but all of those statements are made with customers that we have worked with across the globe who have found and proven those, those business benefit statements right there. So we'd love to come and have a chat to you. Um, hopefully you get a tremendous amount of value about what Levine is, is going to take us through. And we'll be offering a workshop with any organisation that, that is, is uh, willing to engage with us so that we can help them develop a, a plan to ensure um, supply chain resiliency. So just before I hand it across, I will say that uh, IBM, uh, a lot of people in the market uh, marketplaces right across the globe are saying, you know, why is IBM talking about supply chain? Well, they, they produce computers and software, don't they? Well, absolutely, we do. And in fact, we're one of the largest supply chains globally. Right, in terms of manufacturing our own, our own uh, heavy metal uh, machines, our, um, our, our servers, our mainframes, etc. Right, and, and we go back to 2011 and the earthquake that hit Japan and the subsequent tsunami and the huge impact that that had on our global supply chain. We set about ensuring our own supply chain was resilient and more responsive and more intelligent 
um, through the technology that, that we're going to talk to you about today. Right? So in other words, you know, uh, we are drinking our own champagne, if you like. We have learnt the hard way of what it costs our business in the form of these disruptions. Right? And, you know, we have experience in that and we'd like to bring that to bear. So with that, uh, Levine, I will, uh, I'll hand it across to you, sir. Thank you very much, Brent. I trust uh, everyone can see my screen. I'm almost going to be feeling like a disc jockey today, switching screens. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, everyone. And thank you so much to the chamber for affording us this slot in today's session. Uh, just as a heads up, may I please ask everyone to keep their phones handy as we will use them during this session. So I'm not dis discouraging you playing with your phones. Um, I'm sure that we're all agree that the pace at which change is happening in the current economy is incredible. Information needs to be not only shared, but co-created through collaboration across organizational boundaries in a trusted and transparent manner. The latest advances in technology are helping to reduce business friction, elevate transparency as the new currency of trust and enable end-to-end -end supply chain visibility or traceability like we've never seen before. But how do we rapidly embrace this? Change takes time, we all know this. Building solutions takes time. And by the time we're ready to deploy solutions, the world has changed. So what can we do to rapidly, and I really mean rapidly embrace the latest advances in technology to address common challenges? So the agenda for building resilience within and across the ecosystem through advanced digitization is quite simple. Today I'll cover uh, firstly, establishing a current and common situational context and the complication, why it's bad. Um, what are the key attributes of blockchain that would help transform and address these contemporary challenges we're faced with today? Provide the visibility and enable the organization to proactively address disruptions and hence resilience and illustrate through some examples. So before we get stuck into it, I'd like to ask if you would please lean forward a bit, participate in a one to two minute question poll. Um, this will help me fine tune some of the content based on the priorities we're seeing in this uh, conference today. So if you have the Slido app on your phone, just enter the event code you're seeing there or scan the QR code. Uh, and let's go, uh, do the poll for the next uh, minute or two, if that's okay. Can everyone see the poll questions? I haven't seen any votes coming in. Ah, oh, there we go. And I'll leave it for 10 seconds before I flip to the next question. Okay, on to the next question. With respect to adopting emerging technologies, what adoption category do you fall in? I'll keep that for about 20, 25 seconds. Great, let's take a look at the results. So we've had
With the first question, we've had nine people respond. And 60% have trading partner friction uh, disputes and unpredictable demand. 40% um, had visibility and disruption management and wastage. And the rest was all 20%. That's great. In terms of adoption, uh, um, uh, adopting emerging technologies, most of you are early adopter, early majority, and some indicated that they actually do need to change because of market conditions. Well, thank you so much for that. And we'll flip back to the presentation. So no business is an island. Uh, this has always been the case. Your business is part of an ecosystem of business or trading partners. It's pretty obvious, right? You can't uh, dispute that. Now, if you take a bird's eye view of what's happening in your supply chain ecosystem and keep the perspective of being in the middle of it, there's trading partners on either side. You've got, and you've got multiple tiers of it, right? You've got suppliers, customers, 3PLs, financial institutions, and third parties. Pretty obvious, right? Now let's take a look at what kind of activities that take place across the supply chain. Firstly, trading relationships are established or maintained. Physical goods are created, transformed and transported and services are rendered. Physical assets are acquired, deployed and maintained. Business transactions are conducted. Important documents are exchanged. Most importantly, but not the biggest thing or not the vast majority of activities is money changes hands, right? So there's a lot of moving parts and disruption can impact any of these. So within organizations and across the ecosystem, there are some common challenges. And without going through the exhaustive list, firstly, we have with trading partners and relationships, these include increased human errors and rejection rates, there's disputes, there's often high reconciliation efforts and costs and a plethora of trading networks to deal with. This is all about you interacting with your external uh, uh, supply chain, with your trading partners. Across business operations, there are most often challenges with cumbersome technology, inflexible systems, lack of feedback on status of any business process, and disruptions and inefficient processes that create wastage and loss of value. Also loss of revenue, increased cost of goods sold, and increased SGNA. And then we have the lack of visibility that's created by siloed or inconsistent information resulting in a few challenges in terms of decision support. For example, due to volatile demand, there's a difficulty in answering questions like, do we have the right inventory in the right location to fulfill projected demand? With inventory fluctuations, are we facing stock out events that are affecting our financial performance or the ability to provide critical goods? The third area could be logistics constraints. So are you, are you unable to get location intelligence and analyze conditions at hundreds or thousands of locations in your supply chain? And due to shifting supply networks, how do we keep inventory levels where they need to be going forward to reduce shortages in the future? Naturally, the left side of the screen impacts all businesses, no matter what the size, even small and micro businesses. But the right-hand side, as you move towards the right, gets worse the larger the organization is. So if these resonate with you, then ask what is this costing your business? How much money are you losing or leaving on the table? So back to this ecosystem picture, right? Everything is nicely laid out quite neatly. There's enough space between the buildings uh, at the bottom of the screen, right? Now, if we look at how the activities that I mentioned earlier uh, uh, you know, using traditional systems, how they're carried out. We see that traditional systems were and are designed for a world where trade is focused on multiple bi-directional interactions. The exchange of information takes place between pairs of partners. Case in point, in the EDI world, it's about exchanging information between buyer and supplier or sender and receiver, right? And it may come as a surprise to some of you, but you know, the, the invoice, which is actually a request for payment, they have found uh, an invoice dated back 3000 years that was etched on a clay tablet, right? So that simple process of me as a supplier sending you as a buyer invoice and requesting for payment 
that bi-directional exchange of information is dated, right? And some almost say it's past its use by date, right? So in this model, data is siloed within each company. It must be requested and, it re and retrieving it takes time. The exchange of information takes uh, place between pairs of partners. Getting information from distant partners can require intermediaries, time and resources. So a supply chain is really not linear, it's multidimensional. It's an ecosystem, it's a network, right? And now we don't just operate in one in a one business to another business world. We operate in a sharing economy. Even the simple uh, act of buying something online where you and the, and, the, and the supply interact, there's always a third party logistics organization that's delivering the goods, right? So we actually need to share the information with multiple parties. A significant number of these transactions are still paper-based. Believe it or not, the market average, the market stat is about 80% is still paper-based, which creates inefficiencies and opportunities for fraud. And everyone maintains their own transactions. So there's inconsistencies among transactions. It takes time and resources to resolve, often resulting in disputes and a lot of time to reconcile. The whole reason we have B2B integration in the first place is to synchronize those pairs of ERP or accounting systems across organizational boundaries. So this lack of connectedness and visibility is a result of fragmented data across the supply chain. I've already mentioned silos across the ecosystem and silos within each organization. So there's usually no end-to-end -end traceability and poor information sharing. Usually there are also multi-party visibility issues which creates significant inefficiency across the ecosystem, which has far reaching impacts in some industries such as inventory issues, as overproduction, poor forecasting, stockout issues or surplus stock in the wrong places, et cetera. So all of these issues collectively adds to business friction and disputes. Dispute resolution between parties is a slow and tedious process, often impacting business performance resulting in wastage high costs, inability to reduce disruption, response time, and ultimately customer experience. My lovely light bulb moment example is back in 2016, there was an article in the World CFO magazine which says the world's largest light bulb manufacturer manufactures light bulbs pretty much labor free. But when they invoice uh, through the largest retailer, about 2,600 people are employed just to create and process this paper-based invoice, right? So given the multi-party style pairwise interchanges and interactions, business friction is multiplied and amplified across a business and its trading ecosystem, right? So why have I focused spending some time uh, in this session going through these challenges that you most, mostly are aware of? Well, it's really to emphasize that this is an ecosystem-wide problem, not just a problem faced by your business on its own, and needs to be solved from that ecosystem perspective. Individualists, uh, solutions as we've experienced can help a little, but doesn't make the ecosystem efficient. So <clears throat> introduction to blockchain, distributed ledger technology, also known as blockchain, has been around for a while. Amidst a lot of hype and disillusionment and much attention in the media about digital currencies, digital asset trading, non-fungible tokens, et cetera, et cetera, there are still some realistic and practical use cases that impact general business, general everyday business. So the food example that I'll be looking at today has over 300 profile organizations using it already, right? But let's first see how blockchain's characteristics come together to create a more trusted, transparent, and efficient data sharing platform, a new way for trading partners to collaborate to do business together. So being distributed means data on the blockchain is replicated, shared, and synchronized among parties on a distributed ledger without the need for a central administrator. Unlike owned and managed data repositories or databases, blockchain provides an independent data sharing platform. It is immutable, which means once data is entered, it cannot be deleted, unlike data in a database. Edits can be made only by appending new or updated information. So with blockchain, you actually have a permanent record or audit trail of all data entered. The transactions are verifiable and can't be tampered with, and this disincentivizes fraudulent behavior. So because blockchain provides an independent data sharing platform and it's immutable, participants trust it. It's digital. Well, 
digital is not particularly unique to blockchain, right? But it's important to note that all data and relevant business process logic being captured in a standardized way and shared across the ecosystem goes a long way to improving interoperable and unlocks a number of gains in the ecosystem. After all, when a number of parties are working together, interoperability is a must. Because every event and transaction can be captured and not be changed, the source or place of origin and chain of custody, also known as provenance, can be traced end to end and published in a transparent way. And capturing the standardized data improves interoperability and the advanced digitization and sharing of this data as a single source of truth creates value for every participant and encourages collaboration. So rather than the bi-directional exchange of information, information is co-created and shared, and it is a sharing rather than exchanging paradigm. This invariably reduces friction, helps resolve disputes, and increases efficiency across the supply chain. So in a blockchain world, it's a world where there's a network of members all leveraging a trusted, transparent, and shared business processes built off a common ledger or common source of truth on a blockchain network. So in this example, we'll see how the food ecosystem is, trans it's, is transformed. So how it works is all participants in the ecosystem, irrespective of the business size, whether you're a micro business, a farmer, an SME, a home industry, you conduct your activities, your various activities around physical events and business transactions. And these are recorded in a secure manner in the solution. As owners of the data, each participant has full control over who sees that information. And so this all happens via a set of easy to use options like direct capture, uploading of templated information, IoT devices, and integration with systems. Most importantly, all these events are captured using international standards such as GS1, so that interoperability is actually really built into the platform. And every participant captures this information because they all derive value. So straight away, we see people are incentivized. As you can see in this picture, logistics is a key segment. So it's quite important that logistics providers are actually contributed towards capturing all these events. So the benefits accrue across the entire ecosystem. Because blockchain provides an independent data sharing platform, participants trust it. The data immutability creates an auditable record for all transactions, disincentivizing fraudulent behavior. Once data is shared in the single data sharing platform, everyone has instant transparency into the transactions, right? They are authorized to view. And so there's no intermediation required. And dispute resolution using this shared ledger approach can be automated saving times and time and resources. So people are free to conduct higher value activities rather than low value reconciliation and dispute resolution, looking at emails, making phone calls to address disputes and so on, right? So let's pause for a moment and reflect on what is the takeaway from this, right? To reinforce the concepts, there's really generally three entry point conversations to have at the business level. The first is this kind of technology reduces business friction. The second one is it helps to improve provenance, traceability, transparency. And these all mean different things, right? Provenance is the outcome of scientifically verifying and validating the source or origin of something. Traceability is knowing the facts surrounding how a product or material got from its origin to where it is, like event, time, place, who, quantity, ownership, and price for every commercial transaction, for example. So transparency is about disclosing those facts. And the third conversation at a point is business model innovation. This is the next level of the sharing economy where there needs to be a higher degree of collaboration in real time where participants all work off a common ledger or single source of truth. It's also driven by consumer demand and strong competition to raise performance and reduce cost. So this is about fundamentally rethinking how we do business. How do we reinvent our business by a more collaborative business model rather than this bi-directional exchange of information? This is truly the paradigm change we're faced with today. It's an opportunity to rethink about how we do business and not just converting from analog to digital. So the food trust solution that I will talk about here is a business solution that provides secure access to end-to-end -end food supply chain information via specialized modules. 
So the key features which most organizations look for in a solution of this type is easy onboarding so that you can onboard your trading partners, you can capture your various identifiers for your products, your ingredients, your raw materials, your locations where you do business, such as processing plants, distribution centers, warehouses, and so on. The ability to track and trace all the information in terms of capturing purchase orders, uh, things like dispatch advice, shipping notices, all those uh, key business documents. And event data, such, a, such as information that, 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 that is captured surrounding every physical thing that happens to the goods as it moves through the supply chain, whether it's harvested, made, packed, unpacked, transported, received, delivered, and so on. There's also the ability to instantly access digital, dig, digitized documents such as you know, uh, trade certifications, licensing certifications, lab results, anything that's important that supports the uh, uh, exchange of information between trading partners. And then there's, there's advanced insights. And so this is the ability to actually analyze in seconds where and how uh, uh, products are spending time with inventory flow, dwell time, time since harvest, expiry dates, and so on, right? And so this is about providing fresher products, higher quality products, less wastage in a more sustainable food ecosystem. And this is also where artificial intelligence is used to automate things like predictive analytics, which uh, estimate an unknown quantity in terms of what's the likelihood of some event happening. Prescriptive analytics, which tells you or advises you what you should do about a particular situation. And cognitive ad analytics, which helps to provide reasoning, determining hypotheses in terms of why something's happening. Um, and then lastly, the easy access options. So most of uh, solutions like this are Software as a service base doesn't require deployment of software, and it's quite really quite easy to start from the get go. So, looking at some of the key results, generally received, you know, at IBM we've completed over 500 blockchain projects since around 2017. Um, so, generally achieved from a lot of our blockchain projects are a significant reduction in document workflow, around 97% knowing where the inventory is and having that shared visibility increases order conformance. And so together with you know, distributed order management systems, uh, the orchestration or the delivery of product from A to Z can be uh, very agile. Uh, no deliberate mention of A to Z because of Amazon. This provides a much, uh, a much richer and better multi-echelon view of all your products and materials forming an excellent base for multi-echelon inventory optimization across your supply chain. And then lastly, the significant reduction in upstream and downstream traceability effort from the very first project at Walmart, Walmart we were able to prove that we, we were able to uh, reduce the traceability time from seven days to just 2.2 seconds, right? So IBM Food Trust is also more than just a business solution. It comes with a network of participants, which is growing. To date, there's more than 300 high profile food producers and retailers using the solution. And you can see the well-known brands, right? Uh, uh, under this adoption curve. So just to walk you through some case studies, please use your phone again, uh, scan the QR code, and that will show you the traceability or visibility of a particular product uh, using a solution like IBM Food Trust. And I'll keep that on the screen for you to keep looking at. So let's take a few, uh, look at a few brands, right? So we have Carrefour, which is a French supermarket chain. Uh, they, they exist in many parts of the world. Carrefour wanted to improve uh, brand loyalty and trust. Together, we implemented QR codes with chicken products that consumers can scan and gain more information about their source and quality. The camp campaign was a fantastic success. It led to increased sales and greater revenue for Carrefour as well as improved brand trust and customer loyalty. With Nestle Gerber Foods, the challenge was food recalls can actually diminish cost, uh, consumer confidence. And so uh, uh, along the lines of the baby food uh, brand, the, uh, the uh, product data replaces brand loyalty as a primary driver for consumer decision-making, right? So their full food supply chain visibility was difficult because of various complexities in their supply chain. 
So now the traceability information is available in seconds, not days and weeks, and they have fuller visibility into their supply chain, including this complexity across a global supply chain across multiple tiers of uh, uh, suppliers, nations, and and uh, the trading partners. Right, with Walmart, um, you know, they we we started the original pilot with Walmart in 2017, but when an outbreak of foodborne disease happened, uh, it took them, uh, or, uh, you know. Um, uh, a very short space of time to find the source. So they now have better traceability, which helps save lives and allows them to find or act faster and protect the livelihood of farmers by only discarding produce from affected farms. So as I mentioned before, their traceability was reduced significantly. So now it's compulsory for all leafy green vegetable suppliers uh, to actually use food trust. Dole, uh, their challenge was, I'm sure everyone's heard of Dole Food Company. Their challenge was large amounts of data are actually collected during audits, but never really used because they're really not documented in a way that can be shared. There's a lot of paper, a lot of handwritten records, and this was exposed during a uh, romaine lettuce E. coli outbreak. So as, 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 as the benefit, uh, audit data was digitized, secured, permissioned, and shared via the blockchain, which brought in much opportunities for new analytics and AI and insights on compliance data. So uh, at this stage, all divisions with Dow will be fully onboarded by the year 2025. And in that way, we've also deployed many other uh, 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 use cases across the wine network, for example, which creates a secure supply chain for monitoring environmental conditions for higher quality wine, also addresses things like wine fraud, um, and, and uh, combines the use of IoT to monitor the condition under which the wine is transported. The entire distribution network addresses significant challenges around disputes and, uh, and uh, stockouts. The seafood network addresses issues around uh, trust, which generates higher margins. The coffee network is fantastic because it allows consumers to actually uh, support uh, the farmers. So that's just a little a synopsis of a number of case studies. There's much more case studies, right? Um, and so lastly, just to focus on what we covered, uh, you know, IBM Food Trust or Blockchain Transparent Supply is just an example of why blockchain is very relevant to address supply chain challenges. Why does it matter? Today's customers are needing to handle disruptions, resolve issues quicker, uh, and there is a need to build trust and stronger relationships. So business friction can definitely be reduced. Trust in the network can be gained and visibility and traceability like we've never seen before can be achieved, right? And what's the call to action? Uh, firstly, obtain sponsorship for change within the organization. Begin internal briefings. I guess this is your first briefings in terms of the out of the possible. Uh, it may not be the first, of course, if you've already seen this before. And uh, conduct workshops to scope out low hanging fruit. And lastly, well, uh, you know, although it's COTS and really quick to adopt, What's the catch? There is really some work to do, right? And that work is engaging your trading partners, gain their commitment to achieve this kind of benefit in your supply chain. Once they see value and benefits, they will engage their trading partners and so on, right? So that's where the effort should be rather than um, custom building solutions. And with that, I'll hand you back over to Manish and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Levin, wonderful. Uh, what, what a crisp, what such a rich presentation, uh, Levine, wonderful. And I, you know, we asked Levine to do it in 18, 19 minutes. You were spot on. And mostly this takes about 45 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. One message, which, I mean, there was, there were, it was very rich, Levine, Brent and Anu. But one which came out, which struck to me is, you said in your Walmart case study, your track and trace, maybe I may, may not be using the right words, from seven days went to 2.2 seconds. Yes. Now, that is an amazing statistics because the amount of resources which could be redeployed to do more productive work rather than just scanning and finding out stuff. And of course, there were many such examples in your sandbox, which I just scanned, but I'll read leisurely myself. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just tracking in one direction, right? From the store all the way down to which farm uh, was the originator of this contamination, right? But the reality is you need to do it both ways because once you've identified the farm, you need to find out all the stores that actually have supplies from that farm. Yep. 
and then possibly pull it back or you know find a way to Correct. discard the, the the supply and so on and so forth but Indeed. it is very very useful to make this uh, uh, for the ibm team we discussed to make this uh, relevant and real to our singapore sicci members what we did is we picked up one of the startups from our siki launchpad uh, entries and a member company called infotrust and infotrust and prominent labs have come together and they have created a pilot on blockchain and supply supply chain resilience specifically in in fruit and green vegetables and also extending that to ekyc so uh, ekyc is the underlying blockchain technology which kind of touches all domains of supply chain uh, so with uh, i i would now like to invite uh, mr lester and mr gopi lester is the sales head for infotrust he's a part of infotrust team in singapore gopi is the ceo for prominent labs so lester and gopi welcome and you have 15 minutes everybody has been on time so we hope you will be on time as well thank you thank you manish um yeah lester please Okay, uh, hi everyone. Greetings from Singapore. Uh, I'm Lester from InfoTrust. So um, basically we are like the sales arm from our partnership with Prominent. So Prominent is our global technological partner for this entire blockchain industry. So <clears throat> we'll be the ones establishing, establishing the sales channels in Singapore or in the region, whereas uh, Prominent will be in charge for all backend technologies and implementations required. Okay. So for today's agenda will be for us to showcase basically what we have done, the logic behind everything and what we have for our future plans. So number one, we'll be providing an overview on our blockchain products and solution assets. From there, we'll be touching on the fruits blockchain, covering supply chain provenance and authenticity, followed by a customer case study, which we have performed. Last but not least, to introduce our EKYC platform to further substantiate the significance of data due diligence in our uh, modern society right now. Okay, so if you look at the slides uh, being shown, our key focus for 2021 has been on the EKYC platform, our farm to fork agri trace, as well as our logistics track and trace. Okay, so moving forward in 2022, we actually hope to see some further development in this region. That being said, we'll be focusing on establishing an assets marketplace together with you know, involving some crypto exchange as well as game coin exchange because we believe that's the next direction the market will be heading into. Okay, so Foods Blockchain is actually a pilot for the Food Blockchain Con uh, is a pilot project that we've conducted for the food blockchain industry. So basically, it's a provenance solution for high agri slash food products. So it's something that we actually tried out ourselves as well. Okay. Uh, next. So majority of us here, we already know the challenges that we face for this industry. So food counterfeiting is actually a major issue in today's society. $49 billion is involved in food fraud every year, okay, with 34,000 suspect, suspects being net for food counterfeiting. So on top of this, the risk for food contamination is very high on a global scale, and an average of 30% of goods, food goods are actually damaged due to improper handling of perishable goods. Okay, so this is the overall um, information that I'll provide. I'll hand on the time over to Go, uh, Gopi for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lester, and uh, for touching upon the agenda and uh, relevant briefing on uh, fruits blockchain as well as uh, other agenda items. And before I start, uh, it was uh, an impeccable presentation from uh, Mr. Levin of IBM uh, touching the food trust related aspects, uh, which, is, which is kind of a reference material for many of us like uh, blockchain aspirants. So moving on, uh, from a customer perspective of uh, uh, we at Prominent uh, and, and uh, uh, that is a farm producer perspective, our solution basically addresses the supply chain nuances, uh, which we covered already, enabling origin preference and uh, authenticity via blockchain. So uh, 
to make it more customer friendly, what we have done separately is we developed an e-commerce platform uh, acting as an order engine pertaining to which transactions are recorded on blockchain at every handshakes after which a QR code is generated and when scanned for few details on blockchain immutable ledger, which is something which we are inspired from the uh, global giants. We focused in catering uh, both B2, B2B and B2C uh, segment, uh, or rather we can call it as a B2B2C kind of a solution. Uh, and and uh, we predominantly focused on a SaaS model approach in implementing the solution to preferred customers, including- Gopi, Mr. Gopi I think your charts are not moving. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, noting down uh, Mr. Manish, notions. With the payment gateway integrations. So basically the advantage of uh, customers. So when we talk about uh, customers, we have two types. One is our immediate customer who is a farm producer or an aggregator or a trader. And then customer's customer who is an end consumer. So from an end consumer perspective, our uh, customer's uh, customer viewpoint, the solution gives transparency or rather origin provenance and hence enable end customers to consume authentic farm produce, curtailing counterfeit uh, product issues. Uh, moreover, uh, you know, uh, there is nothing required other than a mobile phone, as, as we rightly, say, rightly saw during the previous presentation, to scan the QR, get the provenance details, and what we call it as a farm to fork journey. So in our uh, real world experience, uh, wherein uh, we should ensure that we walk the talk. So what we did is uh, we uh, went to the farms in India. Basically, it was in uh, Rednagri district of uh, Maharashtra. So uh, to, to understand the real world benefits, both from a farm producer perspective, as well as an end customer perspective. So we did a successful pilot on Alfonso mango, which is a fruit or rather known as a king of, king of mangoes, exporting the same from a market in India to Singapore market via multiple expert, uh, export mechanisms and stakeholders and opted for direct selling as well as uh, channel partners via importer connectivities. It was not easy uh, being a startup and uh, being understanding the nuances. It was never easy, but we managed to cover the exact journey as depicted in the slide, right from plucking the mangoes to, to the pack, packing, packing of the same to the logistics and supply chain uh, metrics or supply chain stakeholders right till end customer. So right from, uh, so, so, and then, and, and till the direct sales to the end customer. And uh, we were uh, there uh, in the market, uh, right, right, uh, what to say, on the market to witness customers scanning the QRs and get the urgent traceability, which is, uh, which is the virtue wherein we call the pilot successful, pilot is successful. So our strategy was uh, pretty simple. It was to keep the price slightly more than the market rate, indicating the farm to fork blockchain QR tracking with the package and uh, this garnered customer interest, which resulted in much more higher order volume subsequently. And next time onwards, we had channel partners at both ends, uh, at the exporter side at India, as well as uh, importer side at Singapore, who were working effectively, utilizing our platform right, for the, right from the order matching engine uh, at the e-commerce front, as well as the blockchain platform, which generated the underlying QR and then gave the benefit of end-to-end -end traceability or origin provenance to the end customer. Uh, basically, just to uh, explain uh, what we have done as part of our pilot uh, in terms of uh, our journey uh, with the farmers as well as the farmer community towards end customers. Uh, these are the pertinent details about the pilot which we have done on the ground. Uh, the farm location was, as I said, Ratnagiri district uh, in Maharashtra, India, and uh, the pilot was done uh, between India and Singapore. And uh, we utilized uh, hyperledger mechanisms uh, for uh, blockchain uh, in terms of track entries uh, to talk about the uh, uh, blockchain stack, technology stack, and of course, a normal e-commerce uh, with integrated with payment gateways, which enable the order matching uh, or ordering uh, quite easy, as well as uh, the uh, mobile phones, which were used to uh, scan the QR codes and further get the details. And uh, the end result, it was uh, a successful product, successful pilot. And uh, we are hoping to get more and more customers on board to our platform uh, to an eventually fruitful journey. Now our uh, major learning curve, so from a real world implementation perspective, though we uh, talk, talked uh, much about the theoretical aspect of it, the features of blockchain, the benefits of blockchain, our major learning curve from the pilot implementation was on the value creation possibilities for our immediate customer engagement, which is the farm producer or aggregator or the trader. It was a SaaS model approach which benefited wherein technology incubation cost was completely consumed. And uh, to a major extent, utilizing our uh, available framework, enabling brand value improvisation 
resulting in profitable margin without major cost to the end customer. So that was the major value addition or value improvisation what we did uh, wherein the, the sales, the connectivity sales was mostly peer to peer without any uh, intermediaries required through the platform underlying blockchain, which was developed by Prominent. And uh, it was not an easy task to adopt the latest technology, especially in agri-tech sector, but we were uh, clearly supported by our channel partners like InfoTrust as well as the exporters or trading community who helped us uh, make this pilot successful. Uh, next few slides are a couple of pictures uh, from our live pilot. So this is how we packed our mangoes. We uh, pasted the uh, blockchain QR, which is generated out of the system on the pack of the mangoes while it was being exported from India to Singapore and uh, it was sold uh, to multiple customers in Singapore. So what normally happens is when you scan the QR code right on top of the box, you will get to see all the details pertaining to that particular uh, product which has been packed. Uh, so it was a pack of 12 mangoes which is shipped from India to Singapore and you'll get to see the farm location, the geo coordinates, the farm which is allocated to for this particular particular pilot and uh, the multiple pictures of actual mangoes which are fetched out of this farm and the entire journey of the handshake of the transactions between the farmer, the aggregator, the exporter, the logistics company, the importer and uh, towards the end customer. So that is where we call it uh, farm to fork and the complete journey backed up by blockchain improvised the authenticity of the entire solution and uh, one of the characteristics of blockchain uh, to be very specific. So this, this picture depicts the entire journey and uh, to move uh, just just to highlight uh, how we have created the order matching engine uh, this is the e-commerce platform where we can do the order of the mangoes uh, for the friendly customer and uh, once the mango details are uh, included uh, by the exporter and the importer with the relevant updates towards what is happening during the handshake this is the qr qr generation page uh, for the importer and the end customer wherein uh, the qr is pasted on the box and it fetches all the details once you scan so these are the these are the live pilot screens and uh, our application screens uh, as you can write this on the screen. So our future vision in uh, simple words uh, is to build an ecosystem enabling origin provenance for uh, export quality farm produce with authentic information on farm to fork journey, not just enabling trust, but basically exponency of trust and authenticity with the technology characteristics of uh, something like blockchain. Just, just uh, uh, before winding up the uh, case study on supply chain resilience, uh, what I would like to address is uh, regarding one of our customer engagement. Okay, you have six minutes, my apology. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, as we all know, the complexities involved in uh, cargo supply chain due to fragmented data exchange points and manual interventions, it is, it is, though it is addressed by multiple technology incubations, it is still unaddressed in majority of pain points. So we, what we did is we specified, we took specific pain points and uh, one of our customer who is one of the largest cargo handler in India and Middle East wanted to move a step ahead of their competition, transforming their existing systems and having a blockchain underlying solution. Our challenge was majorly to uh, mitigate the challenges without impacting their existing tech stack and systems, but at the same time address the major issues pointed out in terms of transparency and unavailability of data points across the platform, wherein we launched blockchain to address the transparency issues, enabling an immutable ledger of transactions across the platform, addressing the pertinent issue of data resilience in a scalable manner without impacting their existing IT systems. And uh, the next slide, uh, I'm not going into any details of uh, the architecture, but rather I'll uh, pass on uh, the baton to Mr. Lester to talk about uh, the KVs related product, which addresses uh, the importance of data resilience. Okay, thank you, Gopi. Okay, so the KYC platform, eKYC platform that we come up with is named Duke for 280, which is the first ever blockchain based KYC platform with our own unique feature with our own unique features in Asia itself. So just a brief outline of the market size for this industry. 47% of businesses worldwide are actually spending on digital transformation to accommodate eKYC. Number two, current revenue for 2021 has already hit $295 million USD with a projected CAGR of 24.5% to be achieved by 2030, Okay, which will amount to 1.58 billion US. So these are the figures that we're looking at. Okay, moving on. So basically Duke, uh, Duke for 20 is a hybrid solution for customer screening, number one due diligence, 
risk assessments, underlying blockchain uh, technology, facilitating trust, traceability, and transparency for everyone. So in a way, we are actually coming up with a holistic all-in-one platform to um, satisfy the users who actually adopt such technology. Okay, so through um, we have actually identified some notable competitive advantages. Okay, number one, we will attain immutability of distributed ledgers for the blockchain. Number two, our users will have the option of choosing between different data provider plans, which makes it more convenient for them, not to mention more aggressive pricing from, from our end. Okay, AML, PP, and session screening will be available as well, not to forget ongoing monitoring and auditable reporting, which will be available for all users. Okay. Yep. Uh, thank you, Lester. So, value supply chain is an industry agnostic phenomenon, and therefore, based know how on supply chain participants is a necessity in the current world. So, as already mentioned, Deep Fortuity is an EKYC platform which offers the three packages, as you can rightly see on the screen, and purely segregated uh, in terms of their features. Now, each subscription plan has multiple transaction layers, starting from 500 unique name searches to up to 3,000 unique name searches after which it is per transaction basis. As depicted on slides, the silver package comes with basic features of name screening against PEPs or sanction list or AML list, ongoing monitoring, screening report, et cetera. But whereas the gold has more features pertaining to risk assessments and uh, risk scoring techniques. And platinum is our full package, which includes the customer due diligence aspects and the detailed customer case study. So uh, this particular slide, it articulates the customer flow uh, and then uh, when, when you become a subscriber to the view opportunity platform, which pertains the KVC underlying blockchain, wherein the customer can register, subscribe, log in, and then do the unique name searches. And uh, once the results are done, uh, respective of the package you choose, you can download the report, which is an outcome of the entire search, add to watch list for ongoing monitoring, and you will get uh, all the details in a nutshell in the da dashboard. So overall, this, this unique platform, it caters the importance of the due diligence uh, towards the customer data, as well as importance of data resilience across platform. Say, for example, our customer segments like uh, company secretaries or chat accountants. The importance of data and the importance of the ownership of the data and the chain of custody, who holds what. So this is very important in terms of uh, the importance of data and uh, the usability of data. And this is widely acceptable across multiple supply chain platforms as well. The future possibilities of this platform, or uh, rather what we are focusing, uh, being a blockchain company, is having a, uh, sorry. Uh, apologies, just, just uh, misplaced my mouse. No worries. Okay, so uh, talking about the future of uh, the blocks and uh, the KYC platform. So we are envisioning a KYC data marketplace that brings blockchain, existing blockchain characteristics, but above all, giving the power of data back to the user, which is nothing but the consent management uh, capabilities. Now, the verified and authentic KYC data, which would become data tokens, uh, to, to mention it as data tokens, and the ownership would be with users who can choose subscribers to their new platform verified data. And most importantly, the data set would be kept up to date utilizing the data source providers. Such a marketplace enables regulators across the world to access the data set with the consent of the user, which eases KYC process and onboarding as the case may be. And uh, before winding up, uh, I hope I am uh, on time. I would leave the audience with the thought of having a tradable data token in crypto exchanges in near future, which is probably the end game uh, from a blockchain based company. And uh, the next few slides are a couple of screens of uh, our existing platform, which will be launched in the market soon. And uh, with this, I'm winding up. Thank you, Siki, and for the opportunity and Lester for the support. And it was great uh, to be on this uh, panelist as a speaker. Thank you, Mr. Manisha, as well. Thank you, Gopi. Thank you, Lester. So we, we are nearly on time, just about three, four minutes off.
now the uh, now the time comes for the questions so anu you would take the questions or how how will you will you pass it on uh, to levine and brent as they come yep sure actually i can see um, uh, one question so i will read it out either levine or brent uh, feel free to answer this question is that okay okay for me yeah uh, so uh, the question is uh, are you saying uh, there's no alternative to blockchain that uh, uses traditional technology for reducing business friction and improving visibility. Levine, are you there? Levine or Brent, you would you like to take this question? Uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> really speaking, you know, digitization, creating portals, and B2B technology for collecting information from your trading partners exists. They've existed for a long time, right? Uh, but the problem we're trying to solve is not just collecting information from your immediate suppliers and supplying information to your immediate customers. We're talking about collecting information from the entire ecosystem, right? And typically or traditionally what's happened uh, in the market is large organizations have implemented solutions that suit themselves because automation um, saves them money, reduces friction in their own immediate trading party interactions with their suppliers and customers, right? But this actually fragments the market. Uh, it creates long tail problems in that, when I say long tail, I mean the vast majority of low volume trading partners don't adopt these digital technologies, right? So <clears throat> collecting information from immediate trading partners, yes, there's alternative technologies. But what we're talking about here is collecting information from the entire ecosystem in a way that drives value for every participant, right? Everybody gets value out of it. And we found with the numerous projects we've completed, we found ways of communicating value to every participant, such as you know, a farmer, a, a, a logistics company, a manufacturer, a consumer, and so on. And that's what drives the adoption, right? It's about solving an ecosystem problem rather than an individualistic problem, right? Right, uh, thank you. Thank you, beautifully explained, uh, Levine. Um, I have uh, another question. Um, I will read this out and uh, Manish, uh, uh, either Levine can take it, Brent can take it, or Manish, if you want someone else to answer this question. So what are the limitations of blockchain when it comes to establishing uh, provenance in the supply chain? would ask Levine or Brent to first answer when IBM Levine, has Levine, okay. Levine, oh, Levine. Could you, yeah, Ravine, thank I'm happy you. to answer. Thank so, you. so we've completed over 500 projects uh, with blockchain. I think it's a sizable number, but it by no means says that if you've completed over 500 projects, you know everything they used to know, right? We haven't found any limitations on the technology itself. But what we have found is limitations on how solutions are built, right? And <clears throat> those limitations include not addressing uh, things like adoption barriers, such as varying maturity of various trading partners. For example, some producers, small producers might not have a sophisticated IT system that can integrate with blockchain, right? So they need to find an easy way to actually upload this information into the blockchain, right? So there's, there's, there's multiple uh, adoption barriers that you have with this, right? The second a big issue is the, the lack of use of industry standards, right? So <clears throat> everything in, that happens in a supply chain can be precisely described using industry standards. But if you don't use industry standards, you create an interoperability problem. That means my solution won't work with yours, yours won't work with somebody else's. So that fragments the market. And this is what we've seen in the EDI world, right? The entire EDI market is, is fragmented. This is one of the reasons why we have Pebble in, in Singapore to try and standardize the structure and format and the way invoices are transmitted across uh, the industry. And that's using industry standards. So like that, when blockchain solutions don't use industry standards, <clears throat> they limit the adoption, they limit interoperability and so on, right? The third area is governance uh, and governance is coupled with trust. Why, if I would only adopt a solution if many other organizations are using it, right? And so I trust this technology. Trust is always an issue when you're adopting new innovations, right? So those are just three that I can think of the top of my head 
there are limitations on how solutions are implemented. Wonderful. Very honest, thank you. very nice. <laughs> wow. Awesome, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Levine. And uh, uh, there, there is another question uh, with respect to um, uh, EDI, uh, I think, um, uh, which, which actually it is um, asking that what if existing e-commerce or EDI channels already used for exchanging the transaction documents like purchase order and shipping notices for a significant number of suppliers. So are you advocating or suggesting that those suppliers change their system? Um, what's your take on that? Levine, uh, please help enlighten us on this. Yeah, question. sure. Sure. Look, the reality is there are many organizations and the market average we use is 80, 20, right? 20% 20 of any large enterprises uh, trading partners would use EDI with them because they it's high volume and 80% won't, right? So what, what we, <clears throat> the approach we've taken is the reality is the whole world's not gonna adopt blockchain on, on day one, on day X, right? It's gonna be a migration. And so if organizations are receiving EDI documents, there's no need to force that change upon those suppliers, right? So what, as we generally, uh, as we know generally, uh, buyers or customers drive adoption of channel solutions with their suppliers. So if a, there's a large retailer in Singapore, they would have uh, uh, driven a particular set of standards with their suppliers, right? In this case, what we normally advocate is complementing the existing uh, approach, right? So what can we be done if an, is an, if an organization receives an EDI document, they can transform that to the industry standard that we use and use APIs, for example, and feed those documents into, uh, into the blockchain solution, right? Why it's important to actually put that information into the blockchain solution is, the ultimate goal is you want to create a single source of truth for everybody, right? And so the blockchain solution is more than just capturing EDI documents, right? It captures every event that happens in the supply chain. It captures those transactional documents. It captures other supporting documents such as certifications and so on, right? So you have a single source of truth that provides comprehensive uh, visibility around what's happening in not just your immediate supply chain, but the extended end-to-end -end supply chain beyond your tier one uh, suppliers, for example, right? So this uh, <clears throat> comprehensive view is what's needed if you want to address friction and you want to address disruptions in your supply chain, because if you have no visibility, if you can't see it, you can't manage it, right? So I have, I have one question which came on my mobile uh, WhatsApp. So if I may live in and print one, or maybe I know you also. So the, the question is, we are using standard RDBMS databases. Why blockchain? What is the extra benefit a business person, an SME or a micro business person will get on provenance, single source of truth when our business is not blockchain friendly? That's the question. Sure. So look, there is no business that's blockchain friendly from day one, right? It's a transition, right? So if you have a relational database system and RDBMS, it is hosted somewhere, right? And it cannot be guaranteed to be immutable. It cannot be guaranteed to be tampered proof, right? What's built into the Hyperledger fabric or blockchain solution that we use, it's actually built into the technology. To once a block is encrypted and saved and validated, it cannot be changed. There's no feature in the technology that allows you to go and change that, that block, right? And the fact that it's distributed, that means multiple organizations who are trusted can have copies of it. It means uh, it's trusted, right? So, you know, the challenges with a relational database system is it's not tamper-proof. Uh, it, it, you know, records can be changed. Administrators of the system can actually look at the records and see, so there could be insider issues as well. But the blockchain solution is highly encrypted using uh, a public key infrastructure, right? So nobody can actually scrutinize the records and read it unless they have permission to do so, right? So it is much more uh, uh, secure than uh, a relational database system. And the other thing is uh, RDBMS is hosted by a single organization. It can encourage its own immediate trading partners to use it, but it can't encourage its suppliers, suppliers, suppliers to use it. 
right? And this is the value of blockchain is it provides value for everybody, benefit for everybody, and hence encourages everybody to use it. It's much more of a network model rather than a singleton model. That makes sense. I hope that answered the question. It does, it does. I think it was a great question because you see our members are mostly SMEs and micro SMEs and everybody uh, for the IBM team, everybody in, in Singapore wants to be either in sync with technology or ahead of technology as they do business. But people are grappling like all of us, you know, how does this, what is this new thing which is going to create value for my business? Because some people put food on the table for maybe 10, 15, 20 people, right? And their end game is not to have a, a great, uh, how do I say, self-actualization on need, uh, Maslow's need hierarchy theory through technology yes. to create more profit. <laughs> So, so to just to that point, Manish, you know, uh, for a long time and, and still to this day, you know, blockchain is considered a bit of a, a black art or a science project, if you like. Um, you know, what, what we're engaging with, with is, you know, I mean, IBM traditionally has been, tar you know, has, has been perceived to be targeting at the, the big end of town. You know, it's the large banks, it's large government agencies, whatever. These solutions go all the way to SMEs and micro SMEs and provide value to these organisations, not just the big end of town. And so what I would encourage, uh, you know, the membership that's, uh, that's on the call here is to reach out to us because we can actually help you understand the tangible value in adopting blockchain yard by yard um, and, and, and what we can do, what you can do in 30 days and 60 days and 90 days to deliver value. Uh, at the end of the day, we don't believe that you'll invest um, in ours or anyone's technology for that matter, whether it's blockchain or anything else, unless you see value in it. And it's our job to help you understand that value before, before you ingest. So I'd really encourage the membership here to, um, uh, to get in touch with us and, uh, and to arrange one of those discovery workshops. Thank you, Brent. And I must say that it was very heartening to see that within our fold of members, we have two companies who are not only early adopters, they, they early adopters. seem quite far into blockchain and crypto and, oh, sorry, EKYC, and they have a roadmap. So, yes, you're right. It's not only, I'm borrowing your words, the, the big end of the town, but even the SMEs and micro SMEs in Singapore are looking at blockchain. So that should be heartening to other members who are listening to this webinar. Uh, Anu, one last question, and then we can do close, uh, and you can just do thank you for us. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is one more question. Uh, Levine, you could answer this. Um, how long does it take before we see the benefits? It's, uh, I mean, technically it's a matter of weeks, but the, the challenge is always encouraging your trading partners to get involved, right? Yeah. So if even, so you, Let's 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 be frank here, right? SME businesses can be the first to adopt this without large enterprises asking for it, right? And so, when SME businesses who can adopt this at the cost of a some in some cases lower than a monthly cost of a cloud accounting system, when they adopt this, they actually also make themselves more attractive to larger businesses from a business to business trade e-commerce perspective, right? Because now they're able to share their information in a much more transparent way. It also attracts that, uh, makes them attractive as businesses, right? So really speaking, you know, it could take, it could take a matter of weeks. It takes days to onboard, uh, register your, your, your products and start capturing your data. There's multiple ways. You don't need sophisticated technology to actually capture your data. Yeah, there's this, you know, you can capture data through a mobile app, through an upload, or rekeying it, right? Until there is, um, uh, un until you you're at a stage where your volumes deem that you need to do system to system integration, right? So SME businesses can actually adopt this quite easily, and 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 before large businesses applying pressure to do it, right? Anu, before you do the thank you, may I say uh, just just one statement. Uh, for the Sikhi members, uh, Pooja, uh, Mr. Johnson, our CEO is listening, uh, and also all the members who have dialed in, uh, IBM has been very gracious to offer one-to-one -one interaction through Anu's office in Singapore. So if anybody wishes to have more a detailed interaction, which is quite 
uh, focused on their business needs. IBM has offered that for this for the chambers members. They will do a one to one interaction. And Anu, I think you've put your number and the email on the chat box, right? Chat box. Yes, uh, yes, I've done that, and uh, I think we plan to do an email also later uh, with the members so that uh, they can get back to us. Um, and, and we'll be more than happy to actually do these workshops with uh, IBM team, Brent, Levine, and uh, other extended team. We all will be very, very happy to take all the questions and uh, do a discovery session or a short workshop. So um, thank you, uh, Manish. And uh, this was an awesome session, great insights, great questions, and, 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 and thanks to the lovely and intelligent audience for asking such, such intelligent questions. Uh, well, a big round of applause for everyone. And, uh, and uh, Manish, you already um, uh, mentioned about the workshop and, uh, and, and Brent also mentioned about the work workshop. So I will not take my time there. So basically I would like to do a, uh, take this opportunity to thank Siki for organizing this wonderful webinar. And I would like to extend my special thanks to Dr. T. Chandru, Chairman of Siki, Mr. Manish Tripathi, Vice Chairman of Siki, for all your help and support, Manish. Mr. Johnson Paul, who is the CEO of Siki, for all your support behind the scene, Mr. Paul. Pooja and your team, uh, I think you did a wonderful job uh, uh, behind the scene. So thank you to you and your team as well. And um, uh, last but not the least, a big round of uh, thanks to the wonderful team of speakers who have shared the knowledge uh, with us today. Uh, from IBM, Mr. Brent Lello, the AP sales leader for Sterling Business, Mr. Levine Naidu, executive for Sterling Business, and also Mr. Gopi, Mr. Lester, and Mr. Gyanendra, they are the senior management for InfoTrust Singapore Private Limited and Promenade International. Thank you very much for sharing the knowledge. And um, uh, I would say that uh, this was an excellent session. Good day, everyone, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good day on behalf of Dr. Chandru and, and the chamber and the board members. IBM, thank you. Members, thank you. Good day. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.